jar of anointing oil and it was part of the process and when the rest of the world was facing catastrophe, I mean, painful events transpired in 2020. But before any of that began, the Lord had given me a word. And God said, declare it. And it was a kingdom manifesto. It was a, a word for restoration. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I had no clue that part of the restoration was to include some of my greatest family. In all of my years of ministry, the most precious moment I ever had with brothers was captured in this photo in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And uh, these were pastors that would fly in from all over the nation. And we would gather almost every four to six weeks. And uh, it, was, it was family. It wasn't, it wasn't religion. It wasn't somebody looking for a leader. Somebody teach me about the gospel. It was, if the kingdom of God is anything, and it is what? everything it is supernaturally relational and uh that's what we had i was experiencing kingdom and in this photograph is uh all the way to your right at the bottom right is pastor scott his youth pastor is jay koopman at the time one of the most radical d dudes i've ever met in my life I, I remember it was probably during this time shannon you remember like somebody had, we had some people leave the church because they said I was too intense. Now, I'm a little older. I've kind of calmed down a little bit. Look, my wife, thank you, baby. Other people laughing at me up here. I mean, the things, the ridicule that the man of God has to face. But thank you, baby. That's why I married you. Yeah. But I, I remember, like, I, I'm, I'm telling you, like, folk that we love. And look, when I love, I love hard. I mean, I love with everything. And, and uh, it would just break my heart. Like, like, folk come and tell me, like, oh, Pastor, I, well, I got to go. You're too intense. Like, it's, it's just too intense in here. And I'm like, do you know that in heaven it sounds like the roaring of a, mush, or a rushing mighty wind, the oceans just banging up? Worship, is, it's loud in heaven. Do y'all realize that? And you're just one voice in the multitude saying, holy, holy, holy. I mean, do you realize that? And you're like, and you're telling me I'm too intense. It's too loud in church. Well, you ain't going to make it in heaven. I, I'm, I, you need to get right with Jesus right now. Because it's going to be pretty loud. It's, it's the biggest party you're ever, you ever going to experience in your life. But I got to tell you, uh, this morning... If that was, I'm not going to do a whole bio on Jay, except that if there's one word to describe my brother, <laughs> the word is intense. I've never met anybody in my life. <laughs> come on up, Jay, come on. <laughs> I've never met anybody in my life that I would say, no, that dude's more intense than me. But you're about to meet him today. This is my friend, part of my family. This is Jay Koopman, everybody. Why don't you stand on your feet and give him a little honor? Love you, man. Love you, <laughs> you guys are awesome. Can we honor Pastor Bobby? We love you, Pastor Bobby. <laughs> you guys can be seated. Hey, bro, can you come help me out? Is that all right? <clears throat> You know, uh, when he showed that picture, that really surprised me. That was like, that was almost 20 years ago. And um, to be really honest, that, that pastor, uh, that was the first church I ever worked in as a youth pastor. And you guys may not know this, but many of you guys have heard of Compton, California. Okay, if you haven't, you're, you know, uh, I'm sure you have. Let's just say that. Amen. It's on every rap album in the world. <laughs> Um, but right next to it is a place called Southgate is where I first started youth pastoring. And uh, basically, Southgate is the Latino version of Compton. One of the most gang-affiliated places you've ever been. It's right next to Compton. And so um, when I first graduated from Teen Challenge, how many of you guys just love Teen Challenge? 
Amen. Oh, I forgot. I got the boxes. I got to stay in the boxes so y'all can see me. But when I graduated from Teen Challenge, <clears throat> you know, I was a drug addict. My mom was a prostitute. I, I was just really didn't believe in anything. Um, but, you know, that church was this little church in the hood. And I was the only Caucasian, uh, really, as a youth pastor there. But let me just say this. When I, I went to this little small Bible college out in California, and, you know, I was wondering what I was going to do with my life. Because, you know, the hardest thing about graduating from a place like Teen Challenge is figuring out what's next. And, I, I, you know, I was so happy that I found a family. You know, both of my parents are deceased and I was so happy, you know, I love church because when I came to church, you know, you found new spiritual fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters. And, you know, I just wanted to serve in church. And so I took the job with this pastor. I lived in the Sunday school room upstairs. Veggie Tales were my roommates. I had an old beat up car. And, you know, I say that. Uh, I'm still young. I'm only 42 years old. You got to understand I was 18 years old and I had an old beat up station wagon car and I was so happy to have that car. And I remember I'd come down every Sunday to take a shower and they'd already be practicing worship. So they'd see the youth pastor in his bathrobe going to take a shower because we had a shower in our church to, to give homeless people showers. And, you know, I had 19 rebellious kids and one Christian that went to that church. One Christian youth. And I remember going down there in the first few months I was a youth pastor, I was walking down the street and I got punched in the face at night by a Mexican gang member. And, you know, I realized that I'd risked my life for the enemy when I was in the world. I gave the devil 100% of my life. I was a drug pusher. I was a troublemaker. Listen, I'm short, but I was crazy. Does that make sense? And I said, you know what? The same God, because when I was in Teen Challenge, they took me to this awesome revival. I don't know if you guys ever heard of it. I'm sure some of you have. The Brownsville Revival. And when I saw the power of God hit people, I said, you know what? If God is God in Brownsville, he's the same God in Southgate. He's the same God in Lafayette. Are you hearing me right now? He's the same God in New Orleans. And <laughs> I, I didn't plan on sharing this with you, but when he showed me that picture, I felt like I had to. Is that all right? And... Um, and so, you know, I, I, I went to the pastor and I said, man, I got punched in the face last night walking down the street. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, you know what? The devil doesn't want me here. I said, but God's going to bring a revival here. And listen, I was so young and so dumb enough to believe he could do it. I wasn't mature enough to think, I, I, you know, to think practically like, oh, it's not going to happen. I even had pastors say, why are you there? That's the most dangerous part of Los Angeles. Because you got to understand, the thing about Latino gang neighborhoods is it's mostly uh, methamphetamines, which is a way different danger than people that smoke crack cocaine. People that smoke crack, I know you guys are at church this morning, but let me give you a little bit of drug stuff here. People that smoke crack, they hang out and hide. People that do meth, they shoot guns and kill people. And so I was in this city and I just said, God, I know you can do it. And I remember, man, right around the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pastor Scott, what happened is that pastor was the Spanish pastor. He took over for the senior pastor because the senior pastor fell into sin. It was crazy. And that pastor took over and he said, you know what? We're going to go out to Louisiana and we're going to learn. And he met Pastor Bobby. And Pastor Bobby said, you got to go learn from this church. So we went over to learn from this church and we learned all this strategy of how to have people encounter the Lord and multiply and do all these cool things. And I went back and within two years, our youth group, our young adult group went from 20 to 600 people and revival broke out. Hollywood was driving to the hood to learn about Jesus. Are you hearing me right now? People would come into church and thousands of um, I'm sorry not thousands hundreds of young people would just be laid out because they were hit by the Holy Spirit and that's what started my little life now you're talking about 25 years later been all over the world I worked for Pastor Cheon, who some of you guys may know if you paid attention to what was going on in California. Pastor Cheon is the founder along with Lou Engle of a ministry called The Call. 
which was the largest prayer gathering uh, ever on the National Mall. We gathered a half a million young people to gather on the National Mall to pray to end Roe v. Wade. Amen? And so, you know, Pastor Che has a network of about 160,000 churches where we are influencing those churches, loving on those churches, helping them see revival all over the world. And fast forward to, you know, to 2020 when the pandemic broke out. And I know different people have different philosophies on, you know, how to respond to the pandemic. Listen, I have friends that responded completely different than the way my church responded. But when you live in California, and you're a young man who's your mom was a prostitute your dad was a drug addict you were grown up in an abusive home and the only hope you ever had was not just jesus but the church you see when i i, I never can i be, be real with you and some of you guys please don't judge me i never voted in my life because i was a felon now you have to understand in california you can vote as a felon which i mean that's that's a different story can I just tell you, I got my felony erased last year. But when, I, when, when, when our governor tried to shut down the church, and I'm telling you, this was an agenda. They let pot stores be open. They let strip joints be open, but they didn't want the church to be open because they didn't want us to influence California. And when our governor came against the place that saved my life, I said, wait a minute, now you've picked a fight with the wrong guy. And me and my buddy, Sean Foy, we decided to go out and we went all over America. And thousands and thousands of Christians joined us saying, you know what? In the greatest pandemic in history, we need to worship God. Are y'all with me today? Come on, somebody. <laughs> and so during that time, my pastor sued Governor Newsom. And we got a lot of pushback from that because people say, why is the church suing? Well, at the end of the day, that not only did they come against, you know, uh, uh, the Constitution because they can never mess with the church. But they came against the one thing that's the only hope for America is the church of Jesus Christ. Are you with me right now? Come on, somebody. And no matter what the governor's plan is, I don't know what his plan is. I don't know what some of these elected officials' plans are, but I knew what the devil's plan was. He's going to use whatever he can to tr try to stop us. Because when it gets dark, that's when the, br the light gets brighter. Amen. Are you with me? <laughs> and so we saw revival break out across America. We went to over 160, 70 cities. Now, I can't, can't even count anymore. And last night, we decided to start the tour in 2022, and we started it right here in Lafayette, in your city. And I believe it's full circle of God bringing us back to a place where my life was radically changed because of Pastor Bobby. And so as a way of him blessing me, I hope last night, my little life and my friends and my, my, my community was able to bless you because you are valuable Lafayette you are valuable are you hearing me right now God's got a plan because <laughs> I believe God did that because of this precious man and his beautiful wife and children he said you know what I've got Lafayette on my mind I've got Pastor Bobby I've got it's one church right I've got one church on my mind and this morning I felt the glory in here did you guys feel that <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you for cutting me up a little bit. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's just pray. Can you guys say this after me? Say, dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs> You're awesome, man. I got to admit, when the last song, like, I felt like I was in Louisiana. You guys just have a different sound here, man. And it's so cool, you know? <laughs> we're going to get a little hype now. You ready? That altar call music's good, but we're about to switch it now. You ready for it? You'll be all right. Just rest with me. You good. Stay there, though. Is that all right? Listen. You all right? Just, just switch it out of the tearful mode and let's just, just, just relax. You'll feel it. Don't worry. You just chill. I'll, I'll tell you when you're ready. 
<laughs> That's good. That's good. I like it. How do I scare that big old boy? <laughs> just messing with you. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Listen. <clears throat> You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been grateful and, and I, I've been around a lot of great men of God in my life. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. You know, the Bible says he'll be the father to the fatherless. Yes. And, you know, when God becomes your father, I represent the spirit of adoption. My dad's dead. My mom's deceased. I mean, you know, I really didn't have, I, I can't even tell you what my childhood was like. It was just so abusive. But, you know, when you chase the Lord with all of your heart. He'll put amazing fathers in your life. And I'm really just a cheerleader that goes around and shares the gospel and loves on people and say, listen, not only does God have a plan for you, not only does he want to save you, but God wants to adopt you into the best family ever. And even when you have things that come against you, can I tell you, my God will be with you. He will use you. He will raise you up. Are you hearing me right now? It's good, man. <laughs> you can just rest for a minute. I'll bring you back in in a second. Just chill right there. Cool. That's what I was saying. Like, you don't have to play, don't worry. So, you know, in, in doing that, I've, I've been exposed to these amazing leaders, and, and I've been exposed to different movements. You know, the Let Us Worship movement that we have is like the fourth outpouring that I've been able to be a part of or be exposed to. And I say that because right now we are in a new season in 2022. And you have to understand that season, God is going to do things like what you saw last night is just the beginning of the movie. Okay, we're just the tip of the spear that is demonstrating something that not only are we going to do, but churches are going to do where we're going to see the glory of God come upon us like never before. And when you think about revival and, and, and you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Really, when, when revival breaks out, here's what happens, okay? There's three things that really bring revival, okay? First of all, the church gets renewed, amen? Second of all, people, the world come in and repent, okay? If you want to see marks of revival, everybody say revival. The first thing is we get renewed. Did you guys feel that renewal feeling this morning? The second thing that happens is we see uh, people repent. Last night, I saw people repent. Okay, you saw people repent. There were lives being changed. There were people being delivered of demonic stuff last night. I saw it from the stage. But the third thing that God wants to do is bring reformation. And when we talk about reformation, this is us together taking over cities. I don't know about you, but I want to see revival break out at the bank. I want to see revival break out at the coffee shop. Are you hearing me right? now and for the longest time we've raised up so many people in the church which is awesome and we've brought them into our buildings which I love I'm a pastor of a church okay and and, and it's been like hey let's bring them in here and raise them up to do things in the church but do you know that 99% of Christians they don't work in full-time ministry only 1% and our heart has been to raise you up and you see somebody with an anointing on his life, you're called to preach the gospel. Yes, he may be called to preach the gospel or she may be called to preach the gospel. But what if she's actually called to be a CEO and transform her whole business? Amen. Are you hearing me right now? And we really have not seen this reformation mentality. And a lot of it's because the church has had to get her act together. Before 2020 broke out, I'm telling you right now, we did more building resort churches where children's ministry was like Disneyland instead of raising up leaders and warriors and people that are anointed because the Bible didn't say just to disciple churches. He said we are called to disciple nations. Amen. Are you with me right now? And we have to think outside the box. And what we did is God used us. We tripped into what you guys experienced last night. We just said, you know what? We're bored in California. You're not going to mess with our church. Let's just see who shows up. And thousands of people showed up. And it happened everywhere. Then we went to Portland. Listen to me. After California, within about a week in California, we had 5,000 people on the beach with a battery-operated sound system. We didn't have the Cajun Dome. You couldn't even hear what we were saying. But the people were hungry for something. 
Then we go to Portland, okay? We go to Kenosha where George Floyd was murdered. We go to Portland. We go to Chicago. We go to all these places where people told us Antifa's going to kill you. They're going to, the Satanists are going to try to attack you. It's going to be bad. Don't go. All of a sudden, everywhere we went, six to 7,000 Christians showed up saying, you know what? This is our land. God, you got to do something. Are you with me right now? And I don't think it's because Sean can sing that well or I'm that anointed of a preacher. I think the Christians were waiting on a leader. They were waiting on a leader. And then the media tries to get a hold of it and paint whatever your heart posture is and try to tell you you're this or you're that. Listen to me right now. Every Christian in this room, okay, should be about racial rec 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 reconciliation. We did that all over America. But that can only happen through the name of Jesus. Are you with me right now? Every Christian in here should say, you know what? We've got to end Roe v. Wade. You can't preach life on Sunday and support death on Monday. You can't. But the media wants to divide us. And they're painting a picture to all of us. That's a lie. The reality is, is we are more united across America than we've ever been in our life. And you say, well, wait a minute. I don't know about this church and that church. Let me tell you something. The people that preach the full Bible are united. The people that are lukewarm, <laughs> they're not united. But they weren't united even before the pandemic. Are you with me? And so for you guys this morning, I want you to know one of the things that I thought was just beautiful is seeing the presence of the Lord in here. Because what God is about to do through, and listen to me, I'm a preacher, man. I build churches. You got to understand something. I'm not like some guy that just because I'm a part of this movement, I'm going to come in here and try to pour out our movement upon you. That's not what I'm saying. I preach every weekend just like Pastor Bobby at my church, along with leading Let Us Worship. But my point is this, is that we have to pay attention to the new wineskin. And there's something on the presence of God right now like never before. I don't know how many pastors were on that stage last night, but they weren't there because of me and Sean. They were there because God is up to something. And we're just seeing the beginning of it. Amen. Because as you've noticed, even this morning, we as believers are going after his presence. His presence right now is being manifested like never before. I think of David and his mighty men. And David was beat down, discouraged. All of a sudden, they go into the cave. And I don't know what they did. Scripture can't tell us. But I know a lot about David. And for some reason, I just want to believe that when they went in that cave, David pulled out his instrument and they started singing. Because something happens when you start singing. Are you hearing me right now? Why do you think that we have 45 minutes of singing before Pastor Bobby starts preaching? Because even though he may be intense and I may be intense, you love us a lot more after we get done singing. Amen. Are you hearing me right now? Because the presence showed up. David showed up in the cave and I guarantee you they were probably in there singing and they came out as mighty men. Are you with me? The one thing that you can give God who has everything everything he owns everything is your voluntary love he loves when you joyfully sing and praise listen i'm gonna preach this scripture right here and i'm gonna get out of your hair this morning you can go back and get some sleep because i know you're tired psalms 22 3 it says this in the esv translation yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of israel Say that with me. Say, yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel. The throne of God is the reigning governmental center of the universe. Not the Capitol. Not the White House. Not the embassy. Not Russia or Ukraine. The throne of God is the real governmental center of the universe. Amen. The God of the universe, creation, and humanity takes imperfect people. Look at your neighbor. That's me. 
takes imperfect people with imperfect songs and we and chooses to be enthroned when we sing praise because he is in love with us i'm gonna break it down for you just stay with me when we pray let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven you know what they're doing in heaven they're worshiping god In heaven, they're worshiping God. He says, sing to me, talk to me, and I will put my governmental center of the universe right where you're at when you sing. Stay with me. He wants to feel our love. He said, I'd rather be in the midst of your praises than anywhere else. This is the reason why we see worship movements over the past decade exploding. And they've always exploded. And I know some of us, even me, have to teach the young folks saying, listen, you guys worship worship leaders and blah, 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 blah. Listen to me. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Worship is amazing. Idolizing worship leaders is off. Yeah, you need to listen to your pastor over somebody you're following on social media because he's your pastor. And a lot of times we get celebrities struck by worship communities and all these things. And you don't even know these people. So I understand how dangerous it is to idolize certain things. I don't want you to idolize me. You need to listen to him way more than you listen to me. But my point is this. Is we as humans are the ones that mess things up. No, God is breathing on worship and praise. Because God is about to do something like never before. That's why Judah went before, amen. That's why they sang around as they marched seven times and the walls came down. Because they carried the presence of God. Everybody say the presence. The church in heaven is worshiping. In Revelations chapter 4, you see when they worship, God releases government and power. The same as on the earth. When we worship, he releases his government and his power. Everybody say the presence of God. Worship is the way that, uh, uh, that you know, us and God come into agreement. Listen to me. If one can chase 1,000, two can chase 10,000. That's when men are alive. Imagine when man and God is aligned. Are you hearing me right now? See, when you worship him, your thoughts, your decisions, everything comes into alignment with heaven. That's why some of you fought on the way to church one Sunday. And when y'all started singing, all of a sudden y'all decided to hug each other after about the third song because you were singing and praising. And all of a sudden your offense with your spouse aligned up and said, God said, you need to forgive right now. Because the king came in. Are you with me? Somebody say the presence of the Lord. Your words come into agreement. Your perspective, your thoughts, your reality, and your world come into agreement. When these guys are up here singing and leading and provoking you guys to sing and to praise, all they're trying to do is stir up the hunger inside of you. He is anointed. He is awesome. Amen. But when you guys come into agreement with what he's going after, all of a sudden, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords shows up in your building. Because he is enthroned on the praises of his people. Listen, that's why when we go into Chicago, like last night was the first time we've done anything inside of a building. Imagine, I mean, listen, I love doing the Cajun Dome because it was a prophecy for you guys. It was great for you guys. But imagine if we weren't in a building last night. And all those people would have been gathered in a field. One church. You know the crazy stuff that happened? See, last night, they checked your bags when you walked in. Not in most of our events. They don't check no bags. There ain't nobody checking bags. Dope's being thrown on the stage. You want to know why? Not because I can preach well. Because I don't preach a lot at these events. Sean, we don't preach a lot. The worship hits the room. People get vulnerable. And I say, throw your dope on the stage. It's just heroin needles come flying from everywhere. You can't get a drug addict to give you his drugs. But when God shows up. And he's showing up in our meetings because we are praising him and we are worshiping him. Amen. Listen, man, I was at an event in Chicago and there was this really mega church guy there. He had his mega church with him. They're really kind of, you know, real, real, real sensitive to how they preach and what they share. I could tell he was uncomfortable being with us because of our stance during the pandemic. 
We're preaching and we're worshiping the Lord and all of a sudden I start giving the altar call and dope starts coming on the stage and I was watching him in my, you know, because I like to watch what happens to these guys, you know, because I know the power's coming, right? I was watching this guy and all of a sudden I seen this kid run. He was a drug dealer in Chicago where it's called Heroin Highway, all right? He runs from the street all the way in, takes his fanny pack off, dumps his dope out. This is like crack, pills, everything. Dumps it out at the pastor's feet. I don't even know if he knew that was a pastor. The pastor was just standing there and grabbed the pastor and hugged him and started crying on his shoulder. Only the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can do that. Look, we, you know, we have had a lot of elected officials like the mayor come out to our events we've had some of the you know we've had the governor of florida come to our events because they wanted to be there i've been in these these meetings and people said do you know that's two senators over there and i'd go up to them and say sir we want to honor you if you'd like we'd love to pray for you he's like no i just came for the presence now listen this happens at all of our meetings and some of these guys are uptight you know they got a suit on they're 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 tight could choke a horse One of, one of our friends, I mean, he wears a suit to sleep. And he kept, I, I invited him to come to an event. His name is Eric Metaxas. I invited him to come to our event. And this guy's like rigid, man. He gets out there and the presence starts flowing. And we were marching around the Bronx singing, this is how I fight my battles. And he got so hit by the power of God. He was going, we were going, this is how I fight my battles. And that suit was just got all sweaty. He started, he started going, my battles. Because he was hit by the glory, amen. you got to understand something. Why is dope being thrown on the stage? Why are drug addicts running off the street? Why are people getting delivered in these moments? Because when you sing to the Lord, can I tell you something? If you want to destroy the enemy in Lafayette, stay with me. Here's the punch right here, okay? The enemy has his hands on Lafayette in certain places. Because guess what? We've allowed that to happen. But when you go into those places and you sing, you dethrone the enemy and you enthrone God. When we're in these cities and we're praising and singing them, singing to the Lord, we are dethroning the power of Satan and we're enthroning God. This morning when you lifted your hands and you sang some songs, what happened is God came into the room and he was enthroned because he lives in your praise. Amen. Out of all the places he wants to live, he wants to live when you sing to him and you worship him and you love on him. He lives in the praises of his people. <laughs> Y'all have to understand something. I have, can I get the band to come up? I have, because we're about to have a Holy Ghost party. Y'all all right with that? I have studied church culture along with Pastor Bobby. How do you grow a church? How do you do this? How do you change a city? I know all the leaders. I mean, especially now, I know everybody. You, you name it, the biggest churches I've been around them. I've done events with them. And I came here to tell you this morning, Lafayette, are we in Lafayette? Okay, sometimes I say the wrong city. They're like, no, this ain't Lafayette. I'm like, it's only two minutes that way, all right? Leave me alone. I have, I have done a lot of stuff, man. And, you know, people used to invite me years ago. Stay with me. Some of y'all getting tired. Stay with me. I ain't preached that long. Some people would invite me. It's like, hey, man, I want you to come and train my people in evangelism. I'm like, okay. So you go there. You preach on evangelism. Everybody runs to the altar, says they're going to win souls. Maybe three or four of them continue to do it the rest of their life. Let's be real. Most people, if that's not their gift mix, they don't continue to do it. I've had people invite me, and how do I multiply my church in life groups and small groups? And I go in and train them how to do it. Some of them get it. Some of them don't. I've had people invite us and say, hey, you know, what can we do to see this part of our church on fire? And listen to me, I have tried it all and all of it's amazing and we need all of it. I'm not throwing anything away. Did you hear me? But there's one thing that we all do together. And if I can get us to do one thing that we all can do that's the easy button and I don't think God ever wanted it to be hard. I think the victory's already been won. I think we've already, I think we've strived so hard to try to do things. And the one thing God said, hey, listen to me, if you'll start singing, 
you'll start praising. You'll sing to me a new song, as Psalm says. You know what a new song is? And you'll worship every Sunday and you'll run down to the front. Listen to me. I don't care how bad your week is. If your week has been bad, you better get off your butt and start singing to the Lord. Are you hearing me right now? I don't care if they sing your favorite song. Even if they're not, sing your own song in the church. Who cares? Just start singing to them. Start praising them. Because the easy thing that all of us can do is every Sunday lift up our hands, worship our God, pour out our love. And the King of Kings said, I'll show up. I'll show up. I'll show up. I'll show up. Are y'all with me? I got I got one more point. Just stand with me for just a moment. Can you stand? Y'all get ready. I can I man, this. I gotta stand in front of this thing. <laughs> Look at me. In Psalms, it says, you pulled me out the miry clay. When my life was messed up, I sing a new song to the Lord. Look at me for just a moment, everybody in this room. Everybody. I don't see all your Cajun eyes looking at me. Look at me. Listen, my mom was a prostitute. Y'all heard my story. But you may not know that right when I graduated Teen Challenge, I I went to my mom. And she said, hey, if you'll come visit me, I'll go to church with you. And I'd forgiven her. I'd gotten free of all my junk. Because how many of you guys know a lot of our own problems is unforgiveness? It's a fit. And y'all heard what I said last night. Y'all are some of the best people in the world. And you're such good people. That's why you get so hurt when you get offended. Because you are so good to people. But listen to me. Never, ever, ever do things conditionally. Jesus could have been offended a long time ago, but he loves unconditionally. When you offended him, guess what? He still loved you. You want to know why? Because he never loved you for you. He loved you because that's who he is. He loves no matter what. Are you hearing me right now? He doesn't base it off of what you do. He bases it off of how healed he is because he doesn't need it. He's God. The more healed you are, the more you can love the unloved. You can love people who've hurt you. You can bless the people who spoke against you. Now listen to me. Stay with me. My mama, when I went took her to church, I said, Mama, because I didn't know y'all had cool churches with rock bands back then. I mean, I grew up like, I went to a Methodist church one or two times in my whole life. And I remember the preacher got up there and preached like Pastor Bobby and my mama at the time, my little sister who was the result of prostitution and my mom's boyfriend who slept with her and paid to sleep with her, wasn't even married to her. They all went to the front and they gave their life to the Lord. And they got saved and fully delivered. Now here's what's crazy. My mama, after that, she was one of those wild Christians. She was one of those ladies that brought a flag in that would hit you in the face with it. She was one of those ladies that had a tambourine that would play an offbeat. Y'all would have hated her because she would have thrown you completely off. And here's the crazy thing, man. Sometimes in church, we see those crazy people over there acting fool with the horn, with the tambourine, with the flags. And we're like, man, that person's weird. No, listen to me. My mama was not weird. You don't understand. That was a new song. She said, I'm not in strip clubs no more. I'm not a crack addict anymore. Don't ever judge somebody for beating their tambourine until you know why they're beating that tambourine. You know what Bill let us worship? It was the weird Christians. The people that said, you know what? This pandemic ain't gonna scare me. I was a crack addict. I was a heroin addict. There's no way this sickness is gonna stop me from praising my God, amen. And they showed up with us at every event and they praised. Do you know that some of you in this room, the reason why you even saved today is because somebody over in the corner was praising so hard that day that God showed up, but when you didn't know how to praise, they praised your chains off. They opened up the jail cell for you. And I'm not saying we all gotta be wild with tambourines. All I'm saying is give God your best song. Give God your new song. Give God your full heart. And if I can just leave one thing with you here, one church, if every Sunday you show up, no matter what you're going through, 
and encourage one another. I'm not talking about listening to me. This is me talking. You always listen to the new guy. I'm talking about listening to that guy. I'm talking about listening to that guy and say, you know what? No matter what, I can get down there and move my feet. I can get down there and lift my hands. I, I got a new song in my heart. Even if the devil came against me, I'm going to praise my way through. Amen. I'm going to invite all of you to come out of your seat down here right now. Everybody, come down here right now. Come on, come on.